What's that? You want to be scared? Come with me. You will experience tales of horror, ghosts, and death. It is not recommended for the weak at heart. Listeners in the dark, it's more fun that way. This is Weekly Spooky. Hello, my friends. I am Henry Kuto, your host and narrator, as we bring you just a little bit of Halloween, even though Summer is right around the corner, or maybe it's already started. What day is it? I don't know. (laughs) But I am here to make sure you get your dose of chills, no matter how warm it may get outside. And I hope everyone listening to this is doing very well. Um, You know, obviously, we've been every week talking about all the uncertainty, all the concern out there. But I just hope that if you're listening to this, if this is hitting your ears, I hope that you are well. I hope that your loved ones are well. And I hope that uh, after you listen to this, you take a second and uh, and write a message to somebody you care about that maybe you haven't contacted yet. Um, it's so hard. It's so overwhelming with all this stuff going on with the COVID-19 coronavirus, yada, yada, the lockdowns, the shutdowns. It's so hard to keep track of every person you care about. And it's so easy to forget someone. And then feel bad that you forgot them. Well, don't feel bad. Write them. Give them a a, a little message, a text, an email, a phone call, and just let them know that you hope they're well. You hope they're doing good. You know, do it now. In fact, pause this right now and do that. I'll be here waiting. So, but tonight we have a really cool story. And I say tonight because, of course, Weekly Spooky exists in perpetual nighttime. So we've got a story that is all about actions, reactions, and of course, Echoes Echoes. by Shane Shane Migliavaca. Migliavaca. I first met him last week. Though I'd heard about the new guy in town before that, Castle, New York was the smallest of small towns. Word travels fast when somebody new moves to town. Travis looked like he stepped out of one of those 50s biker films, and last Thursday, when he walked into the diner I work at, I couldn't take my eyes off him, and he knew it. He caught me looking at him and smiled that sly smile of his. My eyes darted away, and I tried to make it look like I was working around the diner, but it was too late. He strode over to me. Hello there, he said. Hey. I tried to sound confident like I didn't give a fuck, but my voice cracked. He smiled at me. Can I get a chocolate milkshake to go? Sure. I heard they're like, wow, here. I started making the shake as he leaned on the counter. He looked at his reflection in the glass case of donuts, adjusting his perfect hair. Yeah, they're really good, I said, unsuccessfully thinking of something cool to say. Lived here all your life? He asked. Unfortunately. Ain't so bad. I've been to worse. I finished the shake and brought it over to him. He gave me a wink and took a sip. Before I could say anything, he slid a $10 bill across the counter. A large silver ring gleamed on his hand. He turned and started to leave. Let me get your change. The rest is for you, Dolly. I watched him go. Dolly? I felt a bit offended. But at the same time, I was feeling something else. Love? Lust? Whatever it was, it made me somewhat forgiving of the Dolly remark. So that's the new guy. Not bad. I turned and it was my coworker and friend, Bren. She adjusted her raven hair. What did he say to you, Ronnie? Nothing much, just wanted a milkshake. Yeah, yours. We both laughed. Bren has this obnoxious laugh that usually ends up making me laugh even harder. The next day, he didn't show up, but the day after that, he was there again, this time wanting a milkshake and a burger. No matter who waited on him, he always ended up talking to me, usually asking me about some town idiosyncrasy or 
whatnot, always coming in at the same time, every other day. It continued like this for a month. We'd small talk a little, and then he'd leave. I never saw him outside of the diner. Then one day, he changed the routine. I got off work one sunny Monday afternoon, and Travis was waiting for me. He was leaning ever so slightly against the side of the diner. He smiled at me. Hey, I said. Hey, he answered. He flicked out a metal lighter and lit a slim cigarette. So what do you do for a kick around here? There's the movie theater or the bowling alley. No, no, you, he took a puff. Me? Uh, not much. Nah? Dang shame. Pretty little girl like you. Um, thanks. The flattery made me blush. Was he hitting on me? I sucked at this kind of thing. I wasn't sure if he wanted me to say anything. I haven't found much in town to get excited about. Dullsville, really. He took a long drag on his cigarette. So I was wondering if, uh, you want to hang? I thought for a second. He's asking me out. I suck at dating. He's good looking and seems nice, but there's no way a date between us won't end in embarrassment for me. And perhaps him too. How can I talk him out of it? It's kind of been a rough day, you know? Mondays? I just want to go back home and chill. It don't have to be today. Oh, cool. So, want to see a flick? He said. Show the new guy the sights? Sure. Am I really going to do this? Yeah, I, I guess I was. Why not? I deserve some fun, right? Right. You do. Bren was always trying to get me to go out. This would really shock her. Tomorrow night good? I thought about it. Did you know I didn't have to work the day after? Sure. Aces. It's a date then. I'll let you pick the flick. Cool? Yeah. He looked at me. You should always have your hair like that. I touched my hair. I forgot I tied it back at work. This was probably the first time he saw it loose. It's so beautiful and red, like a rose. Thanks. My face lit up as I blushed. Great. Gotta run, babe. Be seeing you. He did a little point at me and winked before leaving, the spurs on the back of his cowboy boots jangling as he went. What had I got myself into? Our first date went well, as did the next three. Before I realized it, we were a thing in town. I think Bren was jealous. For our fifth date, Travis wanted to take me on a picnic to Harmony Lake. It would be our first date in a less public space. I wasn't too worried. On every date, Travis had been quite the gentleman. I was getting ready in the apartment I share with Bren. I stood doing my hair. Over and over again. You look good, let it go, she said. I turned from the mirror and presented myself. You think? I said, twirling around in my new dress. You're hideous. Hilarious. Seriously, hun, you look amazeballs. She hugged me. Have fun at the lake. Try not to get too lucky. Hey, it's been a while, but not that long. Travis picked me up in his 1957 Plymouth Fury. It was a convertible. The thing looked like a shark that decided to crawl out of the ocean and start looking for meals on land. He tooted the horn as he pulled up. You look stunning, babe, he said. Ever the gentleman, he wouldn't let me into the car unless he got out and opened the door for me. Some old song was playing on the car radio. In fact, I don't think he ever listened to anything after the 50s. We headed out of town as the king sang on the radio. I can't get over your car, Travis, I said. It looks so good for its age. I'd take care of this baby. Means a lot to me. Sentimental value. I keep her cherry. Try to get maximum performance. He steps on the gas and we're moving a little too fast through town. I look at him nervously as he speeds up. Don't sweat it, Rose. I got this. Travis had started calling me Rose. Honestly, I didn't mind. He took my hand. I think today 
is going to be special. The lake looked beautiful in the summer sun as we walked to a nice secluded spot under a large tree. Travis left the car radio on. Down in the willow garden, where me and my love did meet. He set down a large blanket. My dear, he said, ushering me to the blanket. We brought quite the selection of food. Travis popped open a bottle of wine. Was that weird for a picnic? He caught me making a face. Don't tell me you don't drink wine. No, just seems like a bit much for an afternoon picnic. Well, it's a celebration too, babe. It is? What are we celebrating? Five dates, I laugh. Okay, I'll drink to that. My love, she did not know. The song played on as he poured us each a glass of wine. We eat, and I take a couple sips of wine. I haven't had much in the way of wine, but this is really good. I wonder where he dug it up around here. As we eat, we talk, mostly about me. He always has so many questions. Every time I ask him something about him, he seems sad, almost on the verge of tears. I don't want to bring up any bad memories. As we talk, my head starts to feel light, which was a dreadful sign. What's up, Ronnie? Wow, uh, getting a head rush. I try to stand up, but my legs feel like rubber. Travis catches me as I come crashing back down. On the radio, the song keeps repeating. A dreadful sign. He brushes the hair out of my face and gives me a sad smile. I'm so sorry, doll. What? Sorry about... I stammer. My mouth doesn't want to move. I'm sorry. You have to die. All beauty must die. It's my curse. I summon up all my strength and push away from Travis. He tries to grab me and I scratch his face with my nails. Trying to stand again, I fall to my knees. The world begins shaking apart at the seams. My eyelids feel heavy. Every time I blink, it feels like it'll be my last. Maybe if I just sleep, it'll be better. I'll wake up from this nightmare. No, fight it. I start crawling on all fours, dragging myself, digging my nails into the ground. I have to get away. Have to fight. Have to get to the car. A dreadful sign. I see someone standing by Travis's car. I can't make them out. Why won't they? Help! Please! Rose, no one can help. I'm sorry. He grabs me by the leg, pulling me back. Travis turns me over, glaring at me. The scratches on his face aren't bleeding. I like playing with you, Rose, he said. But my dear, you're breaking my heart. Fuck you. I try to hit him, but I have no strength left. Why won't that person do something? He stands up, pulling a large knife from his leather jacket. I could gut you, but that's no fun. Not anymore. He looks at his reflection on the knife blade. He adjusts his hair. I used to find his vanity cute. Bastard. The poison isn't killing you. Just making it hard for you to do anything. Why? Why not? I tried to move my head to see if that person was still standing there. A dreadful sign. Why is that song repeating? Is that an effect from the drugs? Travis notices me trying to look at the car. I can hear him talking to somebody, I I think. Go away, he says. You're not welcome here. He turns the radio off. Who was that? Who was he talking to? After what seems like hours, Travis comes back holding a large cinder block and rope. Comfortable, doll? Go to hell, I manage, my mouth starting to fail me. Travis just laughs. Be right back. He walks off carrying the cinder block and rope. My mind races. Move! Move! But I can't. It's physically impossible. I try to will myself, picturing my spirit leaving my body, flying over the trees, finding Bren or my folks, telling them what's happening here. If I want it strong enough, I can make it happen. Run! Flee! I will my spirit to soar! He comes back, standing over me. 
He reaches down and grabs my legs. Going for a little trip, my beautiful rose? He drags me across the ground. I can see the grass ending as we go over a rocky area. But I can't feel any of it. I can't feel his hands on my legs, just just a great numbness. We go up a small hill near the beach. He stops dragging me. We're here. We don't have much time left together. He kneels down and touches my face, wiping away my tears. He pulls out two coins and puts one on each of my eyes. I blink my eyes and they slide off. He gets frustrated. Why did you do that? They're for your journey over. He takes them and sticks them in one of my hands, balling it into a fist. I see the cinder block with the rope tied to it near my feet. He crawls over to it and ties the rope to my legs. No, no, no. He's going to drown me. You've been a blast. He picks up the cinder block and walks to the edge of the hill overlooking the lake. I scream, but my throat fails me. I can barely make more than a crackling noise. He hefts the block up. He sighs, parting, sweet sorrow, and whatnot. He throws the block over the side and I can hear the rope quickly chasing after it, knowing that any second I'll be following it. And then I'm falling, followed by the slam of hitting the water. I sink, my lungs quickly filling with water. I welcome it. Please, let there be peace. I feel so tired. I just want it to be over. I can see the sunlight trickling down through the water. Darkness starts to creep into my vision. Until the light is swallowed by it. I wake, unable to move, my heart racing. Where am I? I'm in my room, laying on my bed. I hear a noise, a a crackling hiss, almost like static. My eyes catch movement in the darkness. The thing nears the edge of my bed. My heart pounds faster and faster. Am I having a heart attack? A low whispering hiss comes from the shade at the foot of my bed. Not a dream. Heed the sign. And then, the world went back to normal. I could move again. I wiped the sweat from my forehead. My heartbeat started to slow. I curled up in a ball on the bed, pulling the blankets over me. For the longest time, I I didn't move, fearing that that thing was waiting for me in the darkness. Eventually, I drifted off to sleep again. I woke, and my room was lit by the light of early morning. Had it just been a dream? A nightmare? I get up, dangling my legs over the side of the bed. Was this all a nightmare brought on by being nervous? Over my big date with Travis? I stand in the shower, almost in a trance, as the water pours over me. I've taken plenty of showers before, but this just seems weird. The water feels like it's closing in on me. I I hear the jarring sound of static. Through the shower curtain, I see a dark shape move. The thing from my nightmare. It's back for me. I back against the shower wall. The wet tiles are cold against my back. I run my hands over them, looking for escape. A voice snaps me back to reality. You almost done? Bren says, annoyance in her voice. Water will be freaking cold. Sorry, almost done. I hear the door slam shut. All dread is faded away, and I just feel like a shit for hogging the shower. I get out and dry off quick, trying not to waste any more time. I leave the bathroom a towel wrapped around me. Bren is waiting for me by the door. You okay? Why? What were you doing in the shower so long? Daydreaming? Or a little pre-date gratification? I shoot her a look, and Bren does that laugh of hers. I'm sorry, Ronnie. I know you're all stressed. She gives me a kiss on the cheek and goes into the bathroom, shutting the door behind her. I hear the lock click. Guess I should have done that. At work, it's no easier. My mind drifts all day, thinking about our date this afternoon. The day moves in slow motion. 
What seemed like hours were, in fact, minutes when I looked at the clock and everything I did at work seemed like the wrong thing. Giving people the wrong order, spilling drinks. I shouldn't be this stressed over a date. No, it, it was that dream, that, that nightmare. I consider calling the picnic off, but by the time my shift is over, I've reconsidered. Maybe I could turn this day around. When we get back to the apartment, I strip out of my waitress uniform and splash some water on my face. The water seems to engulf the room for the briefest of seconds, but the hallucination quickly fades. Am I losing my mind? The lake looked beautiful in the summer sun. We found a nice secluded spot under a large tree. Travis left the car nearby. He had the top down and the radio on. Down in the willow garden, where me and my love did meet. He sat down a large basket. My dear, he said, ushering me to the blanket with a wave of his hand. We'd brought quite the selection of food. Travis popped open a bottle of wine. Was that weird for a picnic? He caught me making a face. Have we done this before? Don't tell me you don't drink wine. No, just... Seems a bit much for a afternoon picnic. Well, it's a celebration too, babe. My love, she did not know. I put my hand up. I'm sorry, but I don't think I should. I'm feeling a little sick. Sick? Everything okay? I just had a rough night. Bad nightmare. He touches my hand. I don't know why this makes me flinch. He looks at me puzzled. What kind of nightmare? I think I was drowning, and there was this figure there. When I woke up, I swear it was still there. You know, he starts pouring wine into the glasses. I think you need a little nip of wine, my rose. No, really, it's okay. It'll help your nerves. Okay, maybe just a little. Travis hands me one of the glasses. There's the sound of static cutting through the air like someone's adjusting the radio. A dreadful sign. I look over at Travis's car and see it there. The thing from my nightmare. The glass of wine falls from my hand. It hits the ground, rolling and spilling all over the blanket. The song skips or repeats. A dreadful sign. Not a dream, it said. Heed the sign. At first, I don't realize I'm screaming until I see Travis's face. He grimaces. He grabs me, clapping a hand over my mouth. He holds me so tight, I start to tear up. Shut the fuck up, would you? I try to pull away, but his hands are like iron clamps. I can see the anger in his eyes. He looks over to the thing standing next to the car. A dreadful sign. That's not going to help you, Ronnie, dear, he says his voice never wavering. It's just an echo. As if robbed of its power, the thing evaporates into the air. He tightens his grip. Tears stream down my cheeks, soaking his hand. I see the wine bottle lying there, just out of reach of my free hand. I... I could hit him with it. Listen to yourself. You're gonna hit him? This is nuts. It has to be a game, right? No, it's not. I just need a weapon. to, To get away. I rake his face with my fingernails, scratching jagged lines down his face. For all the world, it sounded like running your nails over stone. He lets go of me, and I lunge for the wine bottle. As I reach for the bottle, he grabs me by the belt of my jeans. The bottle slips from my hands as he yanks me towards him, rolling just out of reach. I dig my feet and hands into the ground, pulling myself towards the bottle, the sun reflecting off of it. Like some magical weapon, it beckoned to me. My arms and legs burned as I strained. Almost, my fingers brushed off the smooth neck of the bottle. Why won't you let me help you, Travis says. Help me? I'm going to free you of all this bullshit. I manage a last bit of strength and grab the goddamn bottle. I swing it and hit him square in the side of the head. Unlike in the movies, the bottle doesn't break. Travis lets go of me. I hit him again, and again. The bottle doesn't break. He falls to the ground, momentarily stunned. 
I bring the bottle down again on his head for good measure. This time, it shatters. I turn and run for his car. As I reach the car, Travis appears, pulling a large knife from his leather jacket. I didn't want to make a mess, Rose. He touches the wounds on his face. Gonna have to fix these. I slide into the driver's seat. Yes! The keys are there. I start the car. It roars to life. I hit the gas, aiming right for Travis. This is insane. Am am I in a never-ending nightmare? I ram into him, sending his body flying up onto the hood. He smashes through the windshield, his face contorted in a wicked smile. Hold hands, you lovebirds, he says. The car plunges into the lake. Water rushes in as we sink. The nightmare. I'm going to drown here. With him, a shard of broken window floats by me as we sink down. I grab it. The jagged edges cut into my hand. I take it, jabbing it into his eye. He lets go of me. He smiles at me as I push him away. I swim through the open top. For however long I live, I don't think I'll ever forget that smile. The jagged shard embedded in his eye. Travis and his car sinking to the bottom. I pull myself onto the beach. I think I pass out for a while, lying there in the dirt, soaking wet. I wake with a start and see a shadow fall across me. I look up and see that thing, the thing from my nightmare standing over me. Its face and arms are blue and bloated, its face vaguely feminine, its remaining hair rotten, hangs down in long strands. It wore a dress. My dress. Ah, see, one of my favorite elements of ghost stories is the idea that maybe it isn't necessarily a literally dead person. Maybe it is, pardon the uh, the use of the word again, an echo. Maybe it is a it is a um, manifestation of something that has happened not necessarily of a person who is dead or a a spirit or what have you I've always thought that was kind of a cool creepy concept for a story Um, but I want to take a second real quick I've mentioned before on the show that I do kind of struggle with what to say before and after these shows because I'm locked up in my home like many many of you but I do want to take a moment to say how incredibly thankful I am Because the listeners of this program and uh, the supporters of many of my endeavors, my movies, my podcasts, etc., have really stepped up and helped me through a very hard time. I I have a web store called henflix.com where I sell movies, and when this all began, I started a sale, and I just did the numbers, and the sale for both months, for both April and, or for um, both uh, uh, March and April, was enough to take care of my groceries and my uh and my dog food and that's you know very moving and i really do appreciate it so i want to say thank you to everyone who has supported me in any way whether it's patreon uh you know giving us a tip at weeklyspooky.com or what have you thank you so much and i want to take that moment to also thank our patreon boosters uh which are uh kevin fry jack kerr karen we met jason limberg craig cohen and rob fields thank you all so much for supporting the show helping me keep going and honestly for helping me uh, pay some bills. It's pretty moving to know that uh, you guys are feeding me breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to catch you next week for me, for our producer, Dan Wilder, and for our wonderful musician, Ray Mattis. Stay scared, and I'll talk at you real soon. Just thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Make sure to find your way back next week. But for now... You're safe. Trust me. <laughs>